Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. On the show this week, we've got Liang Wu, who is the co-founding managing partner at 1126 Capital, an early stage VC investing in diverse founders on the evolving internet across Web 2 and Web 3. Liang is also a Web3 Research Fellow at Harvard Business School, where he helps shape the Web3 curriculum by writing case studies on leading Web3 companies, as well as supporting community building and business development at Harvard's Crypto Lab. He writes regularly on his Life in Color blog at lifeincolor.substack.com, where he explores the why behind Web3. His professional background is a mix of startups, venture capital, and management consulting. Liang is also one of our fantastic mentors for the Techstars Web3 Accelerator program that I lead. In this episode, Liang riffs with me on his one-year reflections on writing the weekly Life in Color blog, including chasing his curiosity, growth in flywheels and content creation, shamelessness as a superpower, and how all of these experiences inform his journey as an investor. All right here on Money Never Sleeps. Hey, Liang. Hey, Pete. How's it going? Good. Great to be doing this. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I'm super excited. I'm um, I'm kind of like the, there might be some things we uncover here that we didn't think we would. <laughs> yeah, that that's what all great podcasts do, right? Exactly, exactly. So let's see if we can we can meander down a path here and see see yeah. what comes of it. But listen, thanks so much for joining the show. I'd say to get started, why don't you maybe share a couple of experiences that sent you down the Web three rabbit hole and kind of what you found when you got there. Yeah, totally. I, I think my Web3 journey definitely requires a couple of rabbit holes. Okay. So maybe I'll start with a, you know, when I was just younger, I grew up as a gamer on the internet. So I've been sort of playing online games when I was growing up and the category of games I play was uh, role-playing games. It was a game called Diablo 2. And what was interesting about this game was, you know, it was just characters on a screen, but people would spend hours playing it. So it's like you get home from high school, maybe do your homework and then get onto the game. And you started like chatting with people. And then over time, what you realize too, is you spend so much time like farming items in this game and all of that. People actually started spinning up forums to trade these items. And so then when you have forums, you then needed a moderator. The problem is that there was no way to understand who was a good moderator versus bad moderator. And it got to this point where like I was a teenager and at one point my friends wanted to play the game and they said, hey, I would pay you to just like not have to grind through the game just so I could have some items. I was like, what do you mean pay me? And so they, you know, they gave me like real money in real life, you know, it was a couple bucks here and there kind of thing. And so that was like my first time when I realized it was so inefficient to go from internet to real life to back to internet. Okay. Yeah. And so then on these forums, people started creating this concept called forum gold. And it's exactly what it sounds like. Pete wants to buy a sword from Liang. I would say, great. I, well, you're in Ireland or I don't know where you are, or you're just a screen name, but pay me in forum gold. So. A bunch of people just on the internet because of this game created this whole system of like economics. And it got to this point where, you know, as a kid, you didn't think about economics or inflation mm -hmm. or any of these like adult things, but you care that, hey, you spent a bunch of time and you were like, you know, giving value to each other. And, you know, this never really went anywhere because it suffered from everything that the moderation on the internet or moderators on forums have, right? Bad actors, all of that. And of course, you know, I eventually graduated high school and went to college and focused on, you know, other things. Right. And so I was like my first formative experience of thinking about like internet value. I won't even say internet money because I don't think that's how I was thinking about it. The second thing that really stands out to me about Web3 was, you know, when I was younger, I came to the States, you know, immigrant family, pretty humble. And when we used to send money back home, it was a whole process. There was like paperwork and you do all of this stuff and none of it really made sense. It wasn't easy. And then on top of that, there were just like a lot of fees. So again, as a kid, I had no context of like how things work in society. All I saw was we're sending back a dollar, but someone's taking X cents of it. Why? And so that was like something that, you know, again, from a humble family, like every penny counted mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I think those two experiences really kind of shaped, you know, Web3 for me. The first time I went down the rabbit hole, I still remember this, was 2015, New Year's Eve, actually. Really? I was on the treadmill. I've been starting to hear a chatter about uh, Bitcoin, you know, and I was in management consulting at the time. And I, I wish they just called it internet money because I think I would have gotten it yeah. right away, quit my job and go work on it. But it was like Bitcoin. So read the white paper, thought it was super cool, but wasn't 
didn't know enough about technology to say whether we, this would be a thing or not. So I didn't really think about it or act on it, which obviously in hindsight is a, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to do my MBA program at, at HBS, that's when I really fell down the rabbit hole because I think I started seeing a lot of activity, a bunch of smart people talking about it. And, you know, when you go to these meetups and talk to people just in the community, everyone was so passionate. And I thought that was something that really kind of sold me. It was like, hey, a bunch of smart people, really passionate. You know, I was at graduate school. The whole point was to explore a bunch of random things and kind of have this little renaissance. And so I had this very like yellow moment of like, I want to work in crypto. And so that's how I you know, started my journey. That's so cool. I, you know, a few parallels there for me is that back in the late 80s, I was playing this online game on a bulletin board where you actually had to okay. do a dial up with a modem. You heard okay, that yeah. crinkling to, right, yeah. to get in. <laughs> And yeah. it, I think the game was just called War, but you would play okay. it against other people that were live on the BBS, the bulletin board system at the same time. And wow. it was, you had bushels of wheat for food to feed your army. You had armies, you had money, and you basically Great. had to go into these battles and accumulate more bushels of wheat and more soldiers and more land. And it just went, it went on and on. And uh, I absolutely love that. But... You know, I, I cool. you couldn't do anything with those bushels of wheat and soldiers that you accumulated other than just, you know, yeah. and money other than just, well, yeah. it's fake internet money. It's not real money. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know? But you spent probably hours playing. I it. did. I did when I was like yeah. 12, 13 years old. I, I absolutely loved it. And also for me, 2014, 2015 were the big years. I read okay. the Bitcoin white paper in 2014. And it was the closeness of that experience to the release of the Ethereum white paper, which got me even more enthralled in all of this. And where I remember I started getting the Finextra newsletter in my old okay. corporate email inbox. And I was tracking the stories in 2015 of who was doing what with blockchain. And this was wow. mostly enterprise blockchain, which hit kind okay. of a you know, an early peak back in 2015, 2016, there's some still some of those, you know, companies and projects hanging around, but th that's what got my imagination flowing there. So it was right about the same time that, that you were getting to it as well, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. And it goes to show you, it's just, it's, it's a global movement, right? It is. If you had access to the internet, read the white paper, or just talk to people, you were starting your first step into, into this whole thing. Yep. I, I remember going and having lunch with a couple of guys in Dublin that were working in the financial services industry. I'm like, listen, everything that you do on your systems are going to be gone in five years because of blockchain. <laughs> this was 20. They probably thought you were, a, it, yeah, they were thought you were crazy. They, it was 2016 and yeah. in 2021, it's still there. And that was yeah. the whole enterprise blockchain thing, which, you know, that I learned after a couple of years of following that and talking to people about it, that. If you want to do anything in enterprise, it's a very long journey. If you're completely yep. replatforming things, it's a very, very long journey. So that will yep. happen eventually, but it's not anything that I'm getting terribly excited about right now. And, you know, those folks that I thought would be out of a job will still have their jobs for some time to come. Yeah. You know? Yeah, totally. Cool. But listen, I wanted to talk about your writing and your Life in Color blog, which is brilliant, yeah. by the way. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Read it every week. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for being a fan, by the way. Oh, yeah. Super fan number one. Yeah, no, no, no. Thrilled to be a fan. And you did recently a reflection on your first year of writing this blog. But, you know, you said in that one year reflection statement, and that was a combination of actual writing in the blog, but also then a, a tweet thread that you put out that you write to chase your curiosity. And I'm interested in yeah. how that process works. And let, let me give you an example, okay? So if I wanted sure. to write about account abstraction, and to most folks out there, that is a meaningless two-word phrase, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Having to do with something on Ethereum called EIP-4337, because I've had to go down yeah. this rabbit hole recently that, yeah. you know, so I'd have to read for three to four hours, and I've probably read for an hour or two already on it. I'd take a yeah. bunch of notes. I'd find some way to distill that down to, into, a, into a meaningful view of the topic, then I'd bounce it off a few folks. I'd enrich my writing with their thoughts and obviously, you know, I'd give them credit for that, but sure. then I'd finish it off with some of the things I do in writing with my own pop culture references and a few, uh, shots and memes of, you know, goodwill hunting. I'd find a way to work that in somehow. Right. Yeah. But yeah. that's myself, but it's a huge commitment. So, yeah. you know, th that's my curiosity. 
and how I would go through it. But how do you actually process this? How do you start stepping through things to chase your curiosity with your writing? Yeah, this is a fantastic question because I think for me on my journey, the, the hardest thing to figure out is the why, right? And, and I think chasing curiosity is something that, you know, for as long as I can remember as a kid, I was a very like curious person. And so you'll see a lot of kind of themes that started off really younger childhood that I didn't really explore, but now really triple click on kind of thing. So when I was younger, I used to ask a lot of questions in grade school and I used to get in trouble for that, which makes no sense. It just goes to show you how, how stupid that is. Right. But I remember one parent teacher conference, the feedback I got, like they told my parents this, but I was in the room was, you know, he's, he's doing all right, but like he asked a lot of questions and that really blew my mind as a negative. Right. I, I think that these days, like in the world, people should ask more questions and all of that. And so this idea of chasing curiosity has always been this thing where in the first part of my career, which is pretty, you know, traditional, like management consulting, just some venture capital and these kind of more traditional jobs, chasing curiosity was something I think people said, but you were always taught to like be in a lane. I think chasing curiosity for me now is a way to really explore a bunch of different things because I don't like the frameworks that exist today that you have to be X or Y. You could be a combination of X and Y and Z, and maybe some days you're X and some days you're Y, whatever, right? And so for me, writing has played this role where it's just me and the computer screen or the proverbial paper, right? I don't, I don't really need anyone but myself and my thoughts. Okay. Uh, and so that's really where it starts. I think on the writing process, you know, spot on. I, I underestimated how hard it is. To be a content creator, you know, in, in in a bit, I will have a piece that comes out called the one person corporation, which kind of touches on a lot of these themes. And, you know, to your point, I think in the beginning, I defaulted to very basic things, right? So I, let's say I wanted to learn about account abstraction, right? I'd probably say I will find four hours to research something or spend an hour or two. And the problem is that that's really hard to carve out, actually. And so my decision in the beginning was, well, if I don't have four hours, guess what? I'm not learning about account abstraction to use an example. I think one thing I've learned a lot, and, and this is really something I'm still optimizing and thinking through is this concept of like a second brain. I don't know if you've heard about it, but the idea is your brain is very good at some things. And while you, uh, humans might have great memories, not everyone does. The question is, should you use your brain power for memory? And so the problem with that, with using for memories, then you don't really get the creative side because that requires a lot of like energy and all of that. And so when I think about writing, you know, the topic you have proposed, I like to think if it's interesting for me, the writing should happen for many hours, you know, maybe very disjointed by minutes and all of that. And learning that learning process in the beginning is really a part of the writing process. And so when I get down to write, I'm not starting from zero. And so what this looks like is for account abstraction, I might have read an article, I might have read a tweet, my friend might have told me about it, and I'll chase it a little bit. The key is capturing that information in a way you could recall later. And so my a lot of my process is I probably think, you know, I probably like to think I probably have like 100 essays I'm working on, but not actively. Yeah. Right. And so, the, and so think of it like 100 topics and like this podcast, right, even as we're talking about it, I have ideas for things I'm working on. But my action after this isn't to write an essay. It's to take down a bullet point in an organization system I have. I use Notion and Apple Notes, right? It's, okay. it's as simple as I can get it. And so what happens is when I sit down to write about account abstraction or even, you know, this podcast, some reflections I have, I then have a place I go to. And what you'll see is you probably have 10, 20, you know, some number of bullet points or content already written such that you're like, I am confident enough to now write an essay. So then the writing process becomes less of, new idea generation, but so much as I already have this like box of Lego blocks, yep. right? Is the metaphor I love. Now I'm going to start organizing. Am I building a house? Am I building, you know, a car? Am I using blue versus red versus yellow? And so that decision becomes a lot less intense because then you're not staring at blank piece of paper, yeah. right? And I, I, I've been saying this a lot. I find it's always easier to edit versus create. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the creation process has these really deep things where when you're staring at a blank piece of paper, you know, I always joke around, the only time you get writer's block is when you sit down to write. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I try to avoid that and just almost like pre-write things by having these experiences, talking about conversations, but then the key is capturing it, capturing it in a system such that when you look at it, you could bang out an essay in 30 minutes. And I've had this happen to me where life just gets busy or, you know, I have travels that come up and all of that. I I post on Mondays, as you know, there are days where I've written like, there are weeks where I've written a 1500 word essay 
and the actual writing process started at 4 p.m. the day before. But I like to think the real writing process started weeks and months totally. before because I've been thinking about it. Totally. That's the, that's that, it. I think that's the key to out there. So right. chasing yeah. your curiosity, you chase it, you grab it, you capture it and you just put yes. it somewhere. You put it somewhere yep. and you're like, yep. okay, I got this. This is a developing idea. When you're doing other stuff, you're thinking about it. I, yeah. yeah. And then it builds up, it builds momentum in your brain mostly. And you may jump in somewhere yeah. else and jot down a few things as you're thinking of it, not to, sure. so you don't forget it. But then once you sit down, it's like, I know exactly what I'm going to write. Yeah. And it just flows. Yeah, yep. exactly. Exactly. I, I think the, there's an opposite effect of the chasing curiosity is knowing when it's good enough to actually become a piece. I think that's the part that's hard, right? Because, and, and that's the art, I think, to it. There, there are times where I feel like I have essays I really want to write because these are things I want to say. And I've had to like, you know, teach myself this or, you know, kind of put some guardrails on. It's not ready for a 1500 word essay yet. But I, oh, geez, I really want to say it. So then now I need to find other avenues to say it. So I started writing more tweet threads, which is honestly a whole different process and skill set. But the key is to allow your mind to chase curiosity freely, but with some structure such that it's not just word vomit left and right. Yeah. And so that's a, that's the fine balance, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got the creative process, which I totally get, but then there's the distribution, right? And, yes. And that that is just as much of a challenge and you could spend more time distributing than you could spend writing. And yep. you mentioned in your reflections, this topic of growth and flywheels and I love flywheels. So seeing that word in print is like a dog, you know, going after a bone for me. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, is this a Pavlov's dog? It, it, totally. The, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Yep. You know, I yeah. see the flywheel spinning in my head anytime yeah. that somebody says that word, it's magic. Yeah. And, yeah, totally. but you're pointing that out as saying doing both business development and marketing with your distribution yeah. and that when you're creating content that you've got this, you, you need to, you can't just do this blanket scattergun approach out to the world and say, Hey, I created this, read it or listen to yeah. it or do whatever you, you do do that. But then you have to step through creatively to make sure it gets into people's hands that you actually yep. want to develop something with, develop a relationship, yep. develop business, develop an investment opportunity, whatever it may be. Can you talk about how that might carry over into something that I know that, you know, you're, you're very much interested in, which is this very careful construct of a community in Web3? Yep. And how you actually go about doing that with this combination of marketing and business development. Yep. Yep. Great, great question. I would just echo the, I'm also a sucker for flywheels. Yeah. I think it's a great way to think. And every time I write the word flywheel, I think of like, what would Pete think? Great <laughs> kind of thing. So, so there's already even a flywheel and then just meta flywheel there is. happening. Yeah. But you know, to your question, it, it's great. I, I think one of the, you know, I'll kind of frame it a little bit. Like one of the things I've learned that I think a lot of people underestimate is the internet has given everyone an information superhighway to distribute content. But because it's given it to everyone, it's actually really hard to do that. And so, you know, I've written about how attention is the new currency, right? Because it kind of all starts from, we have a bunch of stuff going on, we're being bombarded by a lot of things. And in Web3, it's crazy, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of things going on. And so it's easy to say, let's build community. It's actually really hard to capture people's attention and in the in a in a genuine and right way, right? Because otherwise it's not sustained. So I think to your point, I always think of the first part is always there's like product content, independent of who you are, like content is your product, right? But let's just say it's content. I think we've heard the saying content is king, but I think distribution is queen. Yeah. Right. And 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 I think the part that's really hard is people think, well, I create this and, you know, it's a great product. It's a great community. And, you know, my NFT collection is great. The tech is great and all of that. But that assumes people have already found you and fallen in love. And so I think this idea of distribution is really important. And then you layer on top, you know, the question you asked around biz dev, business development versus marketing. In the traditional world, again, we're very structured silo. Right. So I've worked in enterprise SaaS, I've worked in early stage companies, I've worked in crypto. And what you often see is biz dev or sales, right? And marketing are not a part of a flywheel. They're def different departments, which means there are very few people who know how to do both. Mm. Because you don't go into a company and raise your hand for a marketing job and a sales job. Right. And so that's one, a skill set that's like really hard. And so what happens is that there are marketing people who are really great at marketing, 
But what happens if they throw their stuff out on the internet and maybe they know how to do growth and all of that and get a huge following and that's great. But the reality is if 100,000 people follow you, you don't interact with all of them and you're missing the you know, 80, 20 or actually 199, the 1% of people who are like super fans who you should engage with in a way that's less like, hey, I'm sending out a tweet, just please read it versus like, hey, I have this project, which you want to be involved. And then on the other side with business development, it's very much this kind of culture, very like targeted, high value. Like I want to talk to the Pete Townsend of the world or this CEO or that CEO. And, and you know, she's going to say this and that, and she has this preference. I think that skill set is very good if you could get into the meeting, but then now people use marketing to validate how legit you are. Yeah. Right. And so what this looks like is I reach out, you know, I read cases at, at, at Harvard Business School. I reach out to a CEO and maybe they think the brand is great and they'll work with us, but they will still then look at like, what I say on the internet? Right. Or do I have a portfolio and what my marketing is like? So I think the going back to community building, I think the right way or the best way to do it is do both. And it's hard and it's just a new skill set, but Web3 doesn't really have any playbooks. So you kind of have to redefine it. And I think what this really comes from is that the community receives marketing as a way to like, it's kind of like receiving news or like an announcement, right? Or some content, they consume it, it's great. But inevitably when you reach X number of people, some percent of them sh would benefit from like a more high touch, like, hey, whoever really liked this content, we want to do a small like AMA or we want to do some community activation. And what happens there is that the way the flywheel works is that you activate certain people who then become diehards, who then do the marketing yeah. for you, and then so on and so forth. And so I think the, the, the key here is if you come from one or the other, try to lean into the other and learn the other. For content creators, it's really hard because I don't, I, I'm more of a BD person, but growth on the internet is, is like really hard. And there are, is a little bit of, you know, for community builders, sometimes putting out like really awesome stuff. Like you're sitting on a Sunday, you're like, oh, this tweet is awesome. Or like this art graphic is awesome. And then no one shows up. It's like that tree that falls in the forest and no one hears. Yep. And, and I think that that is the tension. And, and quite frankly, where I think a lot of people get burnt out, right? Because no one shows up because they think if you put it out there, though, people will come. I, I love the super fan type development angle. You know, that just, that just makes so much sense. And that what I find with this podcast is that when I have a good guest on, that yep. that guest, if they like the episode and they like how they sound and they like the content, they like the show notes that we did, they'll distribute that themselves and they'll send it around, right? Yep. But it's kind of, but that's a one-off. So it's creating yep. those super fans. When you're writing, it's, well, this for you comes down to readers, you know, yep. and getting people who, like you said, picking that you know, the top 20%, whatever that you can actually engage with and have time to engage with. It's yeah, it, it's a dual commitment that you need to, well, that you're, you have to commit to, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think on the marketing side, the way I think about it is like, when I put it out there and it's for anyone to consume, the metric to me is probably like subscribers or views mm -hmm. or, you know, the, the stuff where it's like very top of the funnel, the BD one's harder to define, right? And even for a community, like, what does that even mean? If you're selling enterprise software, that's easy, right? Number of deals, just close. I think for a community or for like a writer, right? I think about it like number of conversations I have with someone actively on that essay. And I think that's, and you're starting to move lower down the funnel because now you might have, you know, I've had people reach out to some of the essays I've written. They're like, oh, do you also advise projects or do consulting? Because I think this thought is really great. Let's do that. And so you have stuff like that. But the question is, how do you try to be a little bit more organized with all of it versus leaving it up to, you know, the internet algorithms to kind of hopefully pick you, right? <laughs> kind yeah. of thing. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, we talked to Nick Milanovic about this from This Week in Fintech last year. Okay. And that flywheel started to activate for him because he was writing and he was pr previously only writing for the firm that he worked for. And it was just a daily or weekly email that went out called This Week in Fintech. And yep. then when he took that independent and started just doing that himself, same thing happened. People would start coming back to him and say, oh, listen, this company that you didn't mention or yeah. this company that you did mention, could you tell me a little bit more about them? Because I'm thinking about investing in them. And he would wow. then give him his honest opinion. And then he said, well, wait a second. I'm giving this, my honest opinion to people in my network, but I'm forming opinions on the investability of these companies. 
Why don't I yeah. start doing this myself? And then That's what great. he did was he raised a syndicate just off those all those people that were getting in touch with him that happened to be investors. Yep. And so he raised that syndicate and he got that first investment vehicle going and that led him into then launching a fund, right? So there is a, I don't know if that happens by accident or that just happens as a natural conclusion and output to what you're doing, but that, that you know, engaging with the people who come back to you, right? And yep. it, it's, the, you never know where these things are going to go. It's pretty yep, cool. Exactly. One of the other things that you mentioned, Liang, in your reflections was shamelessness as a superpower, right? That you miss 100%. Yeah, I love this one. It's great. Yeah. It, it's you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And yeah. I, I, you know, one of my business associates who shall, she will not be named. I, <laughs> if I try to say this to her, it's like, no, no, no. I get the ultimate pushback. Like, no, no, no. And yeah. just because she's not the type of person to be shameless. But, and, and, you know, how does that fit into something like founder humility, right? Can can you can you set one against the other and say that if you are shameless, then you are not humble? Humble doesn't need to mean introverted and shy. Humble can just mean self-aware, right? Yep. So, you know, that's the thing that I'm interested in just getting your thoughts on is that how does this need to be shameless and have yep. that as a superpower? How does that balance out with the need to be a humble founder? And in Web3, that kind of doesn't always work out, like I said, as shy and standoffish. It works out as self-aware. It's a bit of a deep yeah. question. Yeah, I, and I, I come to you for the deep conversation, so I really appreciate the question. You know, the other thing I would say outside of flywheels is that I, I love two by twos, right? Yes. And you could kind of graph up some of the things you set here on a two by two, or maybe even something more like a three-dimensional. That's, you that's know, three very, three. very HBS of you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe consultant habits, right? But um, it works. Uh, yeah, it works. It works. It, it, it's timeless, I would say. But you know, to your question, I think, I think every combination there's a way to do it, right? And so I'll just pick on like a small example, right? Whether it's humble or standoff-ish, right? I think there's always a balance, and I think shamelessness doesn't necessarily mean you know arrogant yeah. either. And so the way I think about the concept of shamelessness actually is rooted, you know, a lot of the founders I work with, like, they're all really smart, brilliant people. But for some reason, the day and age we, we, we live in, right, people suffer from this thing of like, I am not good enough, or I don't want to do it, or it's cringe or something. And so it's a lot of these like discussions people have internally on like what shamelessness is. The way I think about it is, is slightly different. I think in, in a lot of like the, the way the world is structured and a lot of like how to build a startup and all the gospel out there is, you know, you either can do something or you can't do something, right? And so you oftentimes see, you know, talk to a founder, like, oh, have you explored this? And they'll either say, I can do it because I have the background or I can't do it because I don't have the background. Or to use the last question you asked, I can't do marketing because I didn't come from a marketing background. And so there's a very absolute like either or. I think if you're a little bit more shameless, it's like, well, I don't need to be the best marketer in the world, mm. but maybe I'll send out three tweets this week, or maybe I'll call Pete and beg him to like, you know, introduce me to someone. Right. And I think what happens on the, the reason why people don't do it is this fear that when I do it, nothing happens. And so it's this constant idea. And so I think shamelessness to me, I to the deep part of it, I think of it as like, if you have a long enough time horizon, all of these little things are just experiments. Yep. And so you need to be shameless enough to run experiments, but not shameless enough to be like in this absolute world where like I'm the best and I definitively know that and you should just work with me and be happy to do that. I think that's arrogance. I think shamelessness is really, you know, and I see this in the best founders, right? I don't know marketing, but you know what, YOLO, let's just like try a couple of tweets or let's run a couple of experiments. And if they fail, they fail. And I think this is where the time horizon matters. Like in, there's this chart I saw recently from a guy named Jack Butcher. He has a pretty popular NFT project now, but he had this firm or has this firm called Visualize Value. And he, he does these charts that are really simple. And he has this chart where it's like, you know, the first 10 bars on this bar chart are like nothing. And then it exponential growth. And the part before the exponential growth, you know, he has a little saying there that says, this is pointless. Yeah. And I think that's often yeah. where people feel. And so shamelessness is a way to push through that and, and try to default more to, instead of I can't defaulting to, I, I will try. 
And if you try a bunch of time, it doesn't work and you get feedback, you'll iterate. But what I often find is that I can't prevent you from being in the like, I didn't, uh, you know, missing out on something. But if you try something and it doesn't work, I guarantee you, you're still further along than when you first have the conversation of whether I should do it or not. And so I referenced this in, in the reflection because a good friend of mine, I've known for a decade now, he's a great investor, Wilson at a firm called a basis set. He literally told me, because he's a personal friend, he was like, you need to be more shameless. And this was at a time where I felt like I knew a fair amount about crypto and NFTs and being in a space and writing and just like talking to founders, but I was so afraid to share my knowledge because the discussion I had with myself was like, who the heck on the internet would want to listen to someone like me? And what I realized is that I actually need the internet to listen to me. I need one person to listen yeah. to me. And once you get one person to listen to me, then I maybe need three people four people, five people, right? And, and, and what's, what's, what's interesting is I, I am starting to see signals of success, but that didn't happen because I did something last week. That happened because, you know, for a year and a half, I've been kind of struggling through that this is pointless because I am using shamelessness to just ask these questions. And where this has really been amazing is that I think most of the time asking the question like, Hey, do you want to have this conversation on this podcast? Do you want to write a case together? Do you want to collaborate on this essay? Do you want to explore an investment? All of these questions is actually the starting point to something amazing. And so if I never asked that question, you know, like, or if I've never reached out to you, right, to be a tech stars mentor, we would not be having this conversation. But when I was asking this, and of course I looked up your profile, I was like, oh man, Pete's really legit. Like, what do you want to talk to me? And here we are, you know, a year later, know. multiple coffee chats later, and it's been pretty awesome, right? And yes. I don't even see this now as a business thing. It's like a friendship. It is. We're just like hanging out on the internet, you know? So it's been amazing. I know, I know. Like I heard someone say this morning, it was Peter McCormick. I was listening to him on the, the What Bitcoin Did podcast. And it was like, yeah. you know, finally his wife being able to see that all of his internet friends actually do exist. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess they're yeah, here. Yeah. I did a podcast yeah. with them. Yeah. Really, trust yeah, exactly. me. You know, yeah, exactly. they, they, they aren't just you know AI voice bots that you may hear in the background. But, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm I'm thinking of the, this shamelessness idea. Is I think there's this attachment to goals and this attachment to objectives yeah. and bigger yeah. objectives. So, I've yeah. been doing this master class for a couple of different tech stars programs in the last couple yeah. of weeks on building your investor pipeline with credit yeah. to Jenny Fielding, who ran Techstars yeah. in New York City for a few years. And I'm Great. basically teaching her method and basically saying, when you're raising money as a founder, this is so daunting. Everybody hates it. Yeah. It's just it's yeah. it's just very uncomfortable. But if yeah. you can break it down into a process, into these individual yeah. things, you yeah. are using shamelessness because you need to leverage your network. You need to ask for yeah. help. You need to say, yeah. hey, can you intro me to this specific VC because I really like them and here's why and I can see you have a relationship with them. And it, it's yeah. those little acts of shamelessness that will get you to your big, big goal and your big objective. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's um, it does need to be a superpower. But I, yeah. you know, what how I kind of broke it down for people was that even if you have a little bit of OCD, then... Yeah. And you actually apply yourself to these smaller tasks, yeah. it can become a bit yeah. fun. And I just said this to a founder before you and I started recording this today, Liang. And she's like, Yeah, it will never be fun. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think that the 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 new F word fun, right? Yeah. Let's say, is 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 a very interesting concept that's related to that. And I love where you went with like fundraising, which every founder thinks about, right? Once you raise around, you're thinking about your next round, like and then people who say they don't are, are lying because it's always in the back of your mind. Right. I think when you think about breaking down a process and kind of like doing the routines for it and all of that, the irony of that is if you make it a routine and you make each little action less like, oh, if it doesn't happen, the world's going to end kind of thing. Like if you remove that from it, one, that's actually the, in my mind, the key to success. Right. And this happens in investing with VC. It happens with sales. It happens with fundraising. It's a numbers game. Right. I think it might have been Mark Andreessen and he said this like years ago around like batting averages. Right. Yeah. Everybody in their thing has a batting average. And, you know, in baseball, like you might hit the ball three out of 10 times. And that's your natural thing. That's just your skill. Right. You're not going to be 10 out of 10. Like you're three out of 10. Let's say you 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 that that's the framework. The only way to hit the ball six times, which is two times the amount, is to show up twice the amount of time. 
Yeah. And so you don't, so people try to change their probability from day one of like how they're successful in finding hits. But I actually find the more you show up, right. That's how, you know, you allow this, like all these things to kind of compound on top of each other. I think the irony with the, with the fun word that I was saying is if every dis, if you make a hundred decisions or you do a hundred little routines or 10 little routines a day, or let's say with fundraising, let's say it takes you, you know, a hundred investors emails to get to five yeses. Right. Let's say that's just who yep. you are as a founder. I find if you are really worried about reaching out to any individual one person and you know, not, you're not shameless enough, then the gravity of that one conversation is so heavy, right? Because you're like, oh, if Pete doesn't respond, the world's over, right? Yep. But the reality is if you reach out to 100 people, you shouldn't care that much about what any one person says, yep. right? And yes, you might have a dream investor and that's fine. But like even with tier ones, there's not only one tier one firm, right? There's a lot of blue chips and all of that. And so the way I think about it is if you're fundraising and every day you reach out to 10 people or whatever number that makes you feel comfortable, well, even if you get nine no's, but then the last person who says yes and has a conversation, like shouldn't you just focus on that one yes who really wants to talk to you, but you don't know who's going to say the yes and they only answers to reach out to 10 people yep. and understand, right? And, and so I think a lot of people reason from this idea of like, I will pick that one email, write it for three hours, send it, and that person will say yes. And I think you're putting almost too much like emotional energy into that one task. And then when it fails, you're like, oh, damn, I'm burnt out. This sucks. Fundraising sucks. You know, I'm done, right? Kind of thing. And, and I think all of it is unnecessary almost. Yeah, it is. And it, it is that game of numbers. That, that's a great way to look at it is the only way to get six hits is to go up to bat 20 times. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you're, you're still going to bat 300. That's the only way yep. that you're going to do that. And it's, yep. it's, there's this real, you know, when I, when I think about it, even me, when I'm making introductions to investors, if it's a big name investor, that I've only just started to get to know, I'm like, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to think of a deal? You're going through imposter syndrome, all this other crap, yeah. right? And yeah, then it's like, yeah. I just have this half physical, half mental process of just trying to raise above myself, right? Yep. And say, all right, yep. I just got to get this done and craft this in the best way possible in about two minutes or less. So just do it, yeah, right? Yep. And that you kind of yep. remove your emotion from the process and it, it, yep. it, that tends to work. Yeah, I, I think actually one of the things on this conversation on and a lot is is interesting because, you know, I'm working with founders, you're working with founders, but in a way we're being very entrepreneurial ourselves, mm -hmm. right? You know, content creation, all of these things are just building a platform for ourselves. I think an area that people don't look to for inspiration is sports. And I used to be a consumer of sports, meaning I watch sports, mm -hmm. but I have not really studied the lessons of it. And, you know, people have the quotes, right? That like you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah. But I, I think studying the habits of, of people in sports is amazing. And so there's a story of, you know, Kobe Bryant, who was my favorite basketball player growing up, of him uh, with an Olympic trainer. And, you know, he gets in and the following day is like a Saturday or something. And he tells his trainer, Hey, I'm going to show up at 4 a.m. And the trainer thought he was joking. Yeah. You know, the trainer was like, Oh, you don't, yeah. you don't have to. We don't start till like seven. It was like, No, no, you don't get it. Like, this is not about you. It's just my routine to show up, whether you go or not. Like, I'm going to go shoot a bunch of free throws or do whatever. Right. And I think none of this is like, it's fun or whatever and all of that. But my sense is someone like Kobe or any great athlete has learned to enjoy that. And, you know, this idea of no pain, no gain is real, but the pain doesn't have to suck. Yep. Right. And so there's a the whole idea of working out, right? You go to the gym, you do weights, you run, and it doesn't feel comfortable, but you do it enough that like where you start and where you end up are very different places. And that doesn't happen, you know, without time and over time and without showing up. And so I think between shamelessness and all the things we talked about here, I think that is, is to me the ultimate thing I'm learning about myself is like, even when it sucks, just show up. And you'll be surprised how something happens and the compounding still happen. You just can't see it. I know. I know. And I, I do bring sports into it myself. And I know you like Kobe and may he rest in peace. And it, yeah. a life cut short way too early because he's an yeah, incredible totally. individual. Yeah. He was just know, starting to invest. I'm getting misty while I say that. God honest truth. Yeah. But Michael Jordan, who he was very close with. His thing does bring tears to my eyes, right? Of, yeah. of almost joy yeah. and inspiration, which is. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. Yeah. I've lost yeah. almost 300 games. 
26 yeah. times I've been trusted to take the game winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Yep. That's it. Right. Yeah. And I was you just reading. gotta outlast people. Exactly. That's it. I, I, I read that to one of my kids who were talking about, you know, a tough game that he had had where they lost 12 nothing. You know what? And then yeah. they came back a few months later and they won 12 nothing. You know? So yeah. it it's and it's that that hard graft and you you know, you gotta take those shots. You gotta take the shots that you have. Yep. Pulling this all together, Liang. Yep. I know that, you know, with with you thinking about your investing journey, everything yep. that you're doing right now is kind of or is leading towards that. There may be things that you would do as a writer that you could just keep doing forever. Yep. But there is an investing journey that you're on and how you help founders. How how does this all come together into that into that goal, investing and helping founders? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. And I think like most things, even you know, this concept of being a founder. I think you and I talked about this idea of like <clears throat> the founder spirit, right? And 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 where I'm going with the with that is I think for founders and just like investors, there are a couple of themes and things you kind of have to get right. Right. So so you know, there's a thread across all investors, right? They're usually pretty opinionated. They are you know fairly sharp in, in thinking, all of that. And so those are the things I, I try to say, hey, these are the baseline and, you know, I need to work on it. I think the hard part about being an investor or being a founder is finding your flavor. And so for me, it, it took me a while to understand because you also have to enjoy all of this, right? Otherwise, you're kind of doing a job, which is boring. And so what that translates to is when I first started the investor journey, I thought a lot about how the greats do it. And I was like, oh, if I could just be like them, right? I would just be a great investor. And, and, and it's a pretty bad statement to make because those people are, are better at being themselves than you ever will. And so I've had to learn a lot of understanding my service to founders and like what I'm actually good at. And so, you know, I wrote about the three animals on the internet and one of the themes and concepts I really like that I see a lot about myself and label myself as is this idea of being a chameleon, which is leaning into the situation. And the reason that works for me is because I think I probably have a decent form of intellectual ADD. I call it chasing curiosity, mm -hmm. right? yes, where do. I just happen to know a lot of things about a lot of different things. Like even in crypto, I am not the person to, to be the, first, the foremost expert in the world on like, you know, zero knowledge proofs or anything, but I'm probably like, you know, top X percent, but not, not at the top. But I also know a lot about NFTs and culture and community. And so when I think about being an investor, the thing I try to do to support founders is the things I actually want to work on as the crafts for myself. So I think writing is something that is super important because a lot of founders I talk to want to write because they have a lot to say. That's why they're starting a company, yeah. right? It's like the biggest statement you could ever make is start a company to change something, right? And so they don't know how to translate that, but they all desire it. So I think writing will be helpful in the sense of helping people craft their thoughts and put writing together. Then there's this idea of like being more internet native. Again, I'll call it degen, but in a good way. And, and, and this idea of thought leadership, right? I think a lot of people have a lot to say, but then they get very jaded by saying it and no one shows up because they don't have the biz dev marketing flywheel or yep. whatever, yep. or know how to get into writing a thought piece at, at a publication or something like that, or just even framing their thoughts such that it resonates with their audience. And so I call that the bucket of the thought leadership and something I work on for myself that I like working on that I think I could help founders with. And then there's this clear bucket, you know, my co-founder and I are still shaping this up. But when we look at our career, I actually don't think I've ever had a job in the traditional sense of the word mm -hmm. of like, I am a marketer and I've done it for five years and this is my craft and expertise. I was a management consultant. I worked at a VC firm. You know, when you work on crypto, you kind of have to do a little bit of everything. So every job I've ever had is a bunch of projects. Yeah, It's never a job. And so we're kind of testing this and you're kind of hearing this first, this concept of just being the special projects people for founders. Yeah. And I think in the early stages, every CEO and every founder needs this because they have special projects they have to complete, but they can't hire biz ops. They might have a chief of staff, but if I was going to spend whatever chief of staff salary is today, I might rather just hire another dev or a PM, mm -hmm. right? And so I think we have this ability to kind of drop in 
and support founders in a way that's quite unique. Like we're not going to help you scale marketing from zero to a hundred, but we could help you set up zero to one marketing sales product and all that, because we know a bunch of stuff about a bunch of stuff. Um, I call this like Da Vinci thinking or the Da Vinci lifestyle, but it's really like at heart being the special projects people for founders. And what I've learned through this experience of testing it, like actually working with founders in this way is every founder has a bunch of stuff that is important, but they don't have a person they could give it to. And I'm not saying we go in and do the job for the founders, but a, a, a classic example would be a founder in crypto, let's say they are getting some traction and they want to, you know, put together an event. It sounds like a really simple thing. Except for the fact that like, if your venue sucks, no one shows up. If the time sucks, no one shows up. What are you going to talk about? Like, what's the agenda for it? And it's not just like planning an agenda, but like the topics you talk about, the thought leadership, do we have a panel? And I feel like even that could be very high value if done well. But I think a lot of times it's like check the box thing because they're dealing with 500 other work streams, Yeah. right? And so we kind of co come in and think about all these things. And so a lot of my like advising work with founders today, like one project, I'm sort of like a pseudo researcher in residence, right? I, I basically make sure they are kept in touch with this. The, uh, another one, I'm helping them write a white paper slash protocol design, right? And then another one, I'm basically helping them think through how to construct good tweets, yeah. right? They're kind of like random activities. Yeah. But then if you think about the flywheel of it, I read a lot already. And so to your point about the first question you asked here around like, well, how would you learn about account abstraction? Chances are there's a, a project I'm supporting where that comes up. And so I'm checking multiple boxes at once, right? I am reading about account extraction. Maybe I'm writing an internal research piece for them so that they're smart about it and they know what to do. But then they might say like, who do you know? So then it forces me to go reach out to people who know account abstraction or some special topic. And then we talk to them. And then as I'm learning through all of this, I'm taking my own notes and views on it. And then before you know, it's a light and color essay. I know. And so I think that that's the, that's really the, the flywheel and, and, and the joy I see is that a lot of my job is like writing, talking to people, you know, people like you, this conversation has been great writing, talking to people, publishing something, and then, you know, having conversations like it's, it's a great flywheel because, and that's actually just what I want to do. Yeah. And I think that's the part that gets me really jazzed up is like, you know, I, I, I recently did this exercise around like, what do I want? like my like life to be known for and of course it has to be a punchy statement because it can't be this long thing and i was like if at the end of all of this i completed a thousand meaningful projects I'm, I'm, i i would be happy a thousand and it's very a thousand and, and and it doesn't have to be anything massive it just needs to be something i remember i was like yep that was a project for a time in my life that really mattered and i you know put my mind body and soul into it and crushed it yeah. I, and, and so that's kind of the new thing. I think there is a parallel there between a thousand true fans and, <laughs> and, and a thousand good projects. Yeah. There's yep. something there to draw on for another discussion. And so many yep. colorful things are coming to mind as you're talking about the one thing that I can't let go of is finding your flavor. Right. I love yep. that. And talking to a founder, it's crazy. It's like you were in my ear or on my shoulder with this <laughs> conversation yesterday. We're saying to a founder, listen, really need to find your killer instinct. I really need to be convinced. And he's like, well, it's not very British. And obviously <laughs> a, a guy from London to, to be that outwardly objectively, Hey, you know, dropping an F bombs yeah. all over the place. I, I dropped one for yeah. him because I didn't think he would. And then I apologized yeah. because it was, it was rude of me to drop an F bomb. Yeah. And yeah. then I said, can we find one founder, find your flavor that you admire? And he said, Tom yeah. Blomfield, who was a founder yeah. of Monzo. I said, yes, kind of polite convincing, inspiring covertly, but just always really sounded like he knew exactly what he was talking about. And I said, yeah. there's a few good crowdfunding videos that Tom Blomfield did going back a few years. Go check them out. And I think we found yeah. his flavor, someone for yeah, him to that's be awesome. like, you know, and, 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 you know, it's the five whys. I love the five whys. Or just yeah, taking yeah. taking them on a journey and getting to that point. It's the big buzz for yeah. me. I love and this is a Toyota thing, I think, right? When they were like, oh, why is the plant down? You know, why, why, why? Yeah. And they get, got the answer. Yeah. And, and like and, but, Kaizen, but it applies to everything. Something yeah, like exactly. that or, or Lean Six Sigma, that type of stuff, right? Yeah. So cool. Quick thought. Do you think that all of these deep reflections on the past can inform the future? Yes. I, I totally think so. I think uh, so. It, I guess this is the, the more deeper metaphor part, right, of this conversation. I, I think one of the magic 
of, of, of blockchain, right? And I'll do a shameless plug for Web3 for a second. I think the magic of blockchain that I think people underestimate is actually recorded history, right? And, and literally, it's a chain of blocks, right? Like, it's, yeah. that's what it's about, right? And, you know, to your broader question, it's amazing now because I feel like I have entered this next stage of my life where I'm like going out on my own or doing to what a lot of people think are random things. And they see it as a bad way. And I see it as like, yes, I am doing a lot of random things. I'm moonlighting in a bunch of places. And I think it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Right. Like, like it, it's, it's good in the sense that I want to do it. And what's been informed is that like going back to the chameleon generalist Da Vinci type thinking, like when I was a kid, I just had a lot of different interests, right? Like I recently wrote a really long piece about Pokemon, which for those who don't know, is like the largest grossing IP in the history of the world, bigger than Harry Potter and Hello Kitty and all of that. And I, I thought back to myself, I was like, why did I just spend a week writing about this? And it was like, because I used to play Pokemon. It was a big part of my childhood. But at the same time, I was for some reason also interested in math, right? And then for some reason, I was also interested in like pop culture. And I think the human experience is very much should be like that. And there was a middle part of my career where to your point about goals, there was a lot of like, should, I should do this. I should do this. I should do this. If I did this, this would happen. And you'll realize some of that is true, but it's not. It doesn't work that cleanly. And so when you think about the past informing the future on all levels, personal, investing, Web3 founders, I think this theme applies to all of them, is that I think there are a lot of things in, in anyone's past or in the way the world is and all of that that really informs where the world is going. And you know, I'll use two quick examples, right? One, just industry-wise, like if you think about Bitcoin, when it was born, it was born after the financial crisis. And so... Whether you could run statistical analysis on how people feel about this or that or some like fancy thing, it doesn't really matter, right? The fact was this thing happened, a lot of people were upset, and this crazy idea called internet money was thrown out the internet, and a bunch of people showed up. Yeah, And I think that's all the proof people need to say, like, this is maybe an investing area. Now, the details you might have to iron out, and that's always the case. And again, that's the journey, right? But I think people... You know, I wrote about this recently around like the ideas behind these things that is rooted in history, right? Because all these experiences are captured in either your consciousness or some collective consciousness that then puts it out into the world and these new products, ideas, services, whatever innovation comes out. And they only survive because people had a status quo way of thinking. It was like, oh, this new thing, kind of interesting. We will jump in. And then if it survives, more people will jump in and then more people will jump in. And I think that's like, the right system for things because I think it's fair, right? Like if crypto is supposed to be useful enough or if AI is supposed to be useful enough, it will survive, right? Yeah. It's just natural selection in this really kind of weird way. And I think on the personal side, this one's harder, right? Because anything personal, you're like, oh, now it's about me kind of thing. But I think the same thing, like I think I'm taking this big bet of like going out and doing a bunch of these things. But if it is supposed to work out this way, I will at the end of it find the success I think I am looking for. You will. And that's it. You there's, will. There's like nothing, there's nothing else to it, I think. I know. I know. I mean, I was teaching this class last night, or I call it faculting, because I don't think I'm okay. teaching. I'm on this guest faculty yeah. for this group called Pat yeah. Fintech. And yeah, I yeah. gave, it was the last two hours of a course that I had done the first four hours of a few weeks ago. And yeah. I said, at the end of the last one, the four hour one, I said, do you want to do an AMA and ask me anything on Fintech? Or would you like me to do my Web3 spiel? And they yeah. all, most of them, 75% voted for the Web3 spiel. <laughs> I think it went over a few people's heads last night. And yeah. what is that yeah. going to make me do? That is going to make me rethink my content and rethink yeah. my approach and rethink everything. And people are like, why are you doing this between 8 and 10 o'clock on a Tuesday night while you're in the middle of sourcing this next Techstars Web3 program and then talking to another founder at 10 o'clock after that? I'm like, it's all... Wow. It's all part of this. It's all cumulative. Yeah. It's all learning. Yeah. It's all yeah. trial and error, like you said. And I might have, you know, melted the brains of a few people that are just purely fintech operators. And, you know, but one of the questions that someone did ask was that, listen, what's going to happen? You know, what if Bitcoin doesn't survive? What's going to happen to crypto? And I said, you can't put innovation back in the box. Yeah. Something else yeah. will come after this. We have yeah. a way to prove and govern and have digital value. 
yes. right? That can be exactly. stored, that can be saved, that can be transferred, that can be demonstrated, that is owned. I said, that is a huge innovation. No matter yeah. what story or narrative or, you know, that you want to wrap around this, it's yeah. still a massive, massive innovation. Yeah. I, 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 and I, I love this story because, again, we're like, what, three evangelists in our own right? And we sound like the crazy people. So we do. Like, what are you guys talking about, right? Like, get a real job kind of thing. But, you know, y yesterday I had the tremendous pleasure of not only writing the case with Polygon and, and Sandeep, who is one of the founders, co-founders of Polygon, but he has this thing he says that, you know, I, I think, it, like, I resonate with, but he just says it so well. And I think it's even a Nassim Tlaib uh, quote. But he says, strategy is a very overused word, right? Trial and error is very underestimated or, or something to that effect. And I think that's like the traditional framework is you plan a bunch of stuff and then you go do it and hopefully it works out, right? And and the reality of it is like you, it assumes your planning captures all the craziness in the world, which it doesn't, right? By definition, it, yeah. like it can. I think then people hear trial and error, they're like, well, it's too much risk. It's undue risk. And it's like trial and error does not mean go jump off a cliff. Trial and error just means, okay, which direction do you point? Great. Now that you're pointed there, take a step. Did you hurt yourself because you took a step forward? No. Great. Take another step, right? And I think we live in such a, an either or kind of thing. And people ask you that question. What if Bitcoin fails? Well, I mean, that sucks, right? Because like maybe we're all fans of it and there's a use case for it. But you're telling me all the smart people in the world working on it. And, and you know, you run Techstars Web3 and I'm a mentor. And like all the great people we see working on this, like, if there's one thing fails, this whole thing is going to go away. I mean, I don't know. Like that, that seems like a pretty it's big not. statement to make. That makes not much sense to me. Yeah. You know? There's way too many wicked smart people in here, you know? Just yeah, like, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. You're in Harvard. <laughs> Harvard. Yeah. But listen, Harvard, yeah. we're, we're going to end this story where we usually do end it for anyone that we talk to on Money Never Sleeps, which is with a big question, yeah. Liang Wu. Okay. What is one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? Yeah. Awesome. I, I love this question. I'm at a stage of life right now where like I grew up very analytical and math oriented, all of that. and still have all that. I'm exploring a lot of the arts right now. And so writing is the tangible kind of career related way. But outside of that, food is a very big part of my life, aside from the fact that you know, we all need to eat food. But I've actually started, I would say I've started cooking just because I started like living on my own after college for a decade. But during the pandemic, it really ramped up. And food is my biggest act of service and kindness. And I would say it's gotten pretty ridiculous because I use cooking as a way to explore other cultures. And so, you know, my wife's Indian. I cook a fair amount of Indian food. I cook Chinese food. I had a sourdough phase, which everyone oh, yeah. sort of did, yeah. I guess. I, I had <laughs> some of that for lunch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and so for me, cooking now is this other hobby or project, I guess, for lack of a better word, that has become this art form for me. And it's not just the food but it's the idea of creating like an experience and when i cook i'm like deep in thought it's like a form of meditation for me and one of the things i'm pretty excited by once i, I feel like i get more settled down in new york is start hosting founders where i get to cook something for them mm. from their culture and you know my co-founder and i had this idea of calling like home cooked meals kind of thing and for me it just checks so many boxes and activates so many parts of my personality and it's something i want to double down on and i'm going to do it for myself anyways but i think cooking is an art that has come into my life that i don't know what's where it's going to go but it is something i think a lot about when i'm not talking about web3 and crypto yeah. and investing i'm i'm right there with you and do you think if yeah. if you and your wife or anybody cook the exact same thing with the exact same ingredient the exact same amount of care with the yeah. one that you made taste better or the amount, or, or the one that your wife or somebody else made taste better. Yeah, I, I mean, can I end on the story my professor yes. told me that relates to this? And I'll, I'll promise I'll answer your question directly. I wrote about this on a, on a blog post because I love this story. He told this story, it was a founders like class, a class for founders. And he basically said one time, you know, there was a guy who was training with a monk in the mountains on the last day of the training, the monk gives him a rock. And the guy goes, oh, thank you, but I don't get it. Like, why? He was like, is this a special rock? Like, is it endowed with something and all of that? He was like, no, it's just a rock by the river. He was like, but why? Like, I don't get it. And he was like, oh, no, the gift is that I walked five miles to cook it for you. So the reason my food would taste better is because I will obsess about making sure you feel like you're at home. That's the difference. Ah, 
it it oh there's something that is an analogy right there that just was with me and it's gone it has something to do with craft beer but i'm i can't get there <laughs> Yeah, but that next is, podcast. Uh, next podcast. We'll start here. <laughs> but listen, Liang, thank you for coming on to the show. You are a brilliant mentor for us for the TechStars Web Three program. Appreciate it. So Appreciate thank it. you for, for all that you do for us and for the founders. Obviously, that's it's founder first and give first. So thank you. You live that. Yeah. And I can't wait to kick things off with you. So. Yeah, for sure. Hey, we got Web Three TechStars coming up soon with you running it. So. I'm excited for this cohort. Awesome. It's going to be great. Thanks yeah, so much, thank Liang. Appreciate it. That does it for this week, folks. Thanks to Liang Wu for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. You can learn more about Liang Wu in the show notes on our website, moneyneversleeps.ie. Check out his Life in Color blog on Substack at lifeincolor.substack.com. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify as it helps others to find the show. Thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode. Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3. And I run the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie on how to get in touch. So don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, till next time. Thanks for listening. See ya. Money never sleeps, pal.